The Venerable Master Quagnar was walking with his student, Anton, hoping to prompt the master into discussion. Anton said, Master, I've heard that objects are a very good thing. Is this true? Quagnar looked pityingly at his student and replied, Foolish people, objects are merely a poor man's closures. Chastised, Anton took his leave from his master and returned to his cell, intent on studying closures. He carefully read the entire Land of the Ultimate series and implemented a small scheme interpreter with a closure-based object system. Quagnar has another walk with Anton, who attempts to impress his master by saying, Master, I had diligently studied the matter and now understand that objects are truly a poor man's closures. Quagnar responded by hitting Anton with his stick, saying, when will you learn? Closures are a poor man's object. At that moment, Anton became enlightened. Welcome back, boys and girls. In this video from the introduction, uh, hopefully you can get an idea that we're going to be talking about objects being function of, functions with closures and uh, functions with closures being objects. Uh, the idea here is not so much that one or the other representation is used to represent the same idea, but how you can take this idea of whatever a function with a closure is or an object is and use it to structure your application. So it's more of an architectural thing what I'm going to be demonstrating in this video. So if you've been out there and you're thinking about secure rest, clean architecture, hexagonal, all that bollocks, think of what I'm going to explain in this video as more of a common sense approach. Okay. So without further ado, if you're enjoying the video, leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. Don't forget to check out the description and let's go ahead and get started. Over here, we have the application. And before we start uh, looking through it, let's go ahead and bring up the IL viewer over here where I have the hello world, the Lambda function. This is just to highlight that what C sharp is going to do underneath uh, under the hood is if I pick a lower level C sharp, you will see that wherever I am returning this hello world as a string, this is going to be a internal function and there is no static here. So the function doesn't belong to a class, uh, the function actually belongs to the object. So we will actually have to instantiate this class before we're going to be able to invoke this function. This is again, just to demonstrate that even though you're writing a function, which isn't static, so it is capable of having a closure, in the end, it is going to reach its uh, class representation. And if you have some kind of closure, so stuff that you're passing from the outer scope into the function, that is going to be captured in the fields of the object. Okay, so that is a very quick introduction. I have a very, very old video around this whole topic of uh, lambdas and what they really are under the hood and all the various things that, that get generated when you're writing lambdas. So if you're interested in that, the link to the video will be in the description. So we have the application, we have our Lambda, and uh, we also have the AppDB context. We have something, we have the nested, which is nested inside something. We also have a user. And uh, I may or may not run uh, the application. We'll see how things go. But uh, this, I think, is kind of like a minimal scenario that I need to actually demonstrate. Uh, I don't want to call it architecture, just a common sense arrangement of uh, functions or objects, as you're going to see, and really yielding a, a very understandable code in the end. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, do something super generic. I'm a user, I want to create a something. Okay, and then later on, I want to go ahead and manage nesteds. So you will have your somethings you're going to submit something over here. This is your going to be your model. Ideally, what I prefer is not a command, but a command. And this is going to be a command that the front end is submitting. So you can think of it as a view model, a form, some kind of piece of data that is not the same as the thing you're storing in your database, because there may be more information, there may be less information. And the point is that whatever you're submitting is going to be different. For now, just to get to the point, I'm going to say, look, you are going to be submitting something. And I will name this form to signify that. Uh, the something that you're going to be submitting is, well, it's going to be a form, you're going to fill something out or uh, gather some kind of information from the uh, from the front end, and you're going to submit. it. So the next thing that you're going to have is well, a user is performing this action. 
So you're gonna need to go to the HTTP context, which we don't have here. So let's get our claims principle actually, which is going to be the user and getting the identifier on this user. So find first value, let's say we're gonna get the ID. This is the user ID. And because this is going to return a string, we actually, well, I want to convert it to a GUID because that is what we're storing in our database here. Uh, again, a long uh, story short, you're going to inject your app DB context uh, and you're effectively going to check, does this user have permissions? I know I'm just querying if the user exists or not, but you may have your own tables and this perhaps, depending what kind of permission you're checking, you can tell, okay, this query over here might be a reusable piece of logic. So even when we are going to come up to, uh, let's say, submitting our nesteds. So again, this is still a form. These are going to be nesteds. Uh, now the this operation and this operation is the same. And even though it looks very simple here, these may vary in complexity. This is where I'm going to create a dedicated service for this effectively outlining a function, which I can then compose inside other functions or use inside other functions. So let's create a public class and remember that all I'm really doing is creating a function that I want to run and that function should contain this functionality over here. Again, it may be actually longer. I'm not going to cut this part because the, I think the naming here is pretty important. The focus when you're creating a class is actually on what the function inside the class is going to do. So this function checks if user has permission. Okay, this is going to be your function. And because this function depends on the DB context, that is actually what you're going to inject into the constructor. That is going to be your closure. All right. Uh, and then because that is what we're going to be registering, a user has permission. That is what we're going to check. All right. So check. You can put a sync here if you want. I like to put asyncs over here. But now what we're actually doing is we're just supplying the GUID. So the uh, Lambda that we have over here for the minimal APIs, or if you have the controller, uh, this is your glue between the HTTP world and your business logic. These are your business rules, these functions, which you can then again compose and you're going to see how that happens. Uh, let's go ahead and create the check async function. We're going to move this functionality over here going to make this asynchronous and what we're going to return is going to be a boolean. Now a note on the boolean over here, usually what happens if, if you check permissions, you may be returning an object that you're going to need to use further down the line, perhaps even when you're processing the form. I'm going to show you how to handle that as well. Uh, so anyway, we have user has permissions and now that is what we're using over here. So if a user has permissions, not, uh, we want to make sure that we are awaiting on this. Uh, you return results or bid and that's pretty much the gist of it. Okay. Again, uh, don't forget to await over here. Now to effectively evolve this example, I will need to go ahead and process this form and then process this form because the step is very repeatable. I'm going to cut the video here and you're just going to see the end result. Okay. So I create the two services, one that creates something, the other, the other one that's create that creates nested. I inject both of the services into this Lambda function and then I use that to process the form. I'm going to get a result and uh, that's effectively what I want to return. So things are looking super simple. Now let's say we want to generate some kind of audit records, who's the user, what time we're creating this at. So this is information that the server has not necessarily what or who is submitting the form. Uh, this sort of metadata can go besides this, right? So you don't want to submit it as part of the form, the original thing that you submit over here, keep it immutable, preferably have it just as a record. For the execute async, when it would, when it requires, uh, you are going to add user ID to it and it's effectively like the main journey. And then as uh, the server is going to execute these functions, it's going to append its own context to it. All right. So let's go ahead, copy this user ID. We're not going to do anything with it here, but this is just to illustrate 
that this additional information comes as a second parameter in to this service okay and this sort of information can come from a result of another service which is chained one after the other all right now one more important thing perhaps what you're gonna have is some kind of validation so i'm gonna put this validation in terms of this name being null or empty so is null or empty uh, this name something so otherwise we're going to return null and say that nothing has happened okay i'm just going to put an exclamation mark here because it doesn't really matter maybe you throw exceptions maybe you have your own uh, results interface that you're using not too important the important thing here is that you have some kind of validation here and some kind of validation here and here it's going to perform on the nested so validation is it a concern of a create nested function and the answer is no create nested function should be concerned with creating the thing uh, because again creating you may be appending this uh, system dependent information perhaps you're emitting some kind of events so even though the logic looks uh, super simple over here it actually may be a lot more convoluted than it seems all right so what you actually do is you take this out into its own service so then it can actually be reused as well, all right? So I'm taking out the if statement check inside the create nested into its own service, can create nested. And uh, you can see here, we're not really taking any closure. Chances are you may or may not need this. Perhaps you can just get away with a static function. But most of the time, whenever you're creating uh, these functions with closures, uh, the closures will generally contain the services or if it's actually going to capture contextual information like the user ID, perhaps you want to instantiate this manually. So there is nothing bad in doing something like this. Can create nested and actually supplying the DB context in the constructor, okay? So these can actually be created ad hoc and you can supply things like something into here, okay? Uh, not necessarily that you need to put these into uh, these uh, fu into the function parameters, okay? What I'm basically saying is this, uh, there, there are no hard rules here. So, uh, sometimes you will use your judgment and you will say, okay, uh, this thing that you, I'm passing over here, it's going to have to be used across uh, many functions within this object because chances are, if you have a class like this with a function, it's going to be performing more work than just one line. Perhaps it's going to be spanning more functions that are going to be as part of this object and they're all going to actually depend on this something. So at that point, it makes sense to make it global rather than just passing it around between functions all the time. Okay, so just be aware that this is okay. All right, uh, we're gonna do the same for create something and remove this if statement. So the can create something and uh, can create uh, nested, all of these go again as services over here. So when we are failing this check, what we're gonna do is return a bad request and we're gonna do the same for our somethings over here. In order for this to work, uh, what you're gonna have to do is then register all of these services with the dependency injection container. So let's go ahead and do that, just like that. And you're pretty much done at this point. Now, uh, first of all, uh, other things that you can do with this, and uh, this will depend on how your application is structured, but you can, uh, be because effectively these are all services, you can inject them into other services and you can compose this different ways. So with nested, let's have an example. Uh, I'm gonna go down here and I'll create a class, public class user creates nested in transaction, okay? For this, I'm gonna need an app uh, DB context by specifying the name of user creates nested in transaction, I am uh, automatically saying, look, this is not just uh, creating nested. Now I'm saying that uh, whatever you're thinking about, there's going to be a user that is attempting to create this and we want to run this in a transaction. So you would have your execute function and all of the stuff that you have been doing over here uh, let's take it and we're going to drag it into here. In addition, where the DB context, uh, you can have a database. Uh, 
and begin transaction and at the end you want to go ahead and commit it so then over here what you're really going to be injecting is this um, operation right you can name it operation you can give it the full name but you're going to be able to see it by the type so operation execute async uh, form and uh, then it's going to be user id uh, await you're going to get the same result and in the end that is what you're going to return so for other things that should have been injected into here that I have now deleted, let me go ahead and maybe grab these services. It's going to be a little bit easier for me to rename them. Just grab the some things and put nested in here. All right. Uh, for this, again, I did mention that you may have your own uh, result implementation. Perhaps you're going to throw an exception here and you're going to catch it over here. All right. In the end, let's just return uh, I result, uh, or sorry, it's going to be results. Okay, this result over here, and I believe this is going to be asynchronous. That's what it's t telling me over there. And this result over here is already going to be an I result, so I can just return it straight away. So again, you have these little composable pieces that you can outline custom contexts. And uh, just to give you again, an example, what we're going to do is we're going to create things in a batch where again we are going to be able to reuse this logic so public class create something in a batch so again i'm giving this a very generic name perhaps in your line of business you want to submit files on its own as part of a batch as many files as part of some kind of other process where the function for verif verifying a file, unpacking a file, validating a file, transferring a file, etc. You want to have that as a reusable piece of logic. And the way that you're validating the file in one place, perhaps you don't want to do the same validation in another place. Or perhaps if a background job is uh, doing the submission, suddenly you don't want this process to be dependent on this user ID context. So you can freely reuse, create something without saying, ah, actually, uh, there is a user ID that always has to be present over here. Okay, so those kind of decisions have to be done by you. You don't want to suddenly say, ah, the user ID parameter is optional. What you want to say is create something from a background job. And then uh, that function can be reused amongst background jobs. You understand its place in your application and how it's going to be used in production. Is the user going to be using this logic or is your system going to be using this logic in the background? All right. So create something in a batch. So we're still going to be submitting uh, not a nested, uh, but we're going to be doing something similar to what we're doing over here with some things. Uh, we're going to be submitting a something instead. So this is going to be a form. And we do want uh, to check if the user has permissions, the user is going to have the same permissions and we want to check if the user creates something. So it's going to be pretty much the same thing here. However, the execute async, it no longer uh, makes sense for me to commit um, or to call db save changes async multiple times. And maybe it would be, um, more beneficial to explain what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to submit a form and in the form, there's going to be the something included with nested. So I effectively, I want to create like 10 entities. Perhaps it's going to be many somethings with uh, many nested. So in reality, what's actually going to happen is this is going to, let's say, take an app DB context, a DB context over here. Uh, we're going to take the something, we're going to add the form. At this point, Entity Framework Core will obviously automatically take care of adding the nested. But as I said, uh, this is perhaps going to be a command that is going to contain various types of information. So just to highlight that uh, the process for registering this information or how you want to actually attach it to your DB context is going to be slightly different. So. Uh, this should not be nullable or sorry, I'm going to be adding this to nested. Okay, so I've registered these and now the logic for these is different from how I've been doing it before, but the save changes comes out there in the end. Or can create something and user has permissions. Uh, let's go ahead and grab these two from here. 
we're going to attach it to this service over here. And we're going to need one more thing because we're going to be creating nested. Uh, we want to check if you can create nested. Perhaps the permissions for that are actually different. So let's paste the service over here. Can create nested and make sure I format everything. And the same thing that we're doing over here, perhaps uh, we want to aggregate these errors into a batch result that we're going to say uh, the first record is invalid, the fifth record is invalid, or you just say a record was invalid, right? Again, uh, the intricacies of your business rules and what you actually want to do with this is up to you. What I'm showing you is how you can actually split this out into its own functions by saying, okay, there is one screen where you can do this, create something in a batch, and you can have one function relate to that one screen rather than it being a function in a repository and then many functions depending on each other and then you change one function it changes to others no here you can confidently perhaps duplicate code from one place into another or if you can see how you can reuse one of these functions you can do so so let's continue this can create check this is going to be form nested again against this user ID. If not, we return bad request. We don't want to add this here because the validation for this bulk upload is pretty unique. It's just for this thing over here. And again, in the end, we do save uh, changes, return uh, results. I'm going to return OK. <laughs> As a, or, or maybe, yeah, let's go ahead and just say we're going to return the form over here. OK. And this is going to look a pretty similar to how we have the nested over here. Let's go ahead and do something or let's just call it bulk upload. All right. Uh, again, this is going to be something we're going to be using the user and create uh, something in a batch. OK, this was actually a batch. Uh, this is our operation. Uh, we perform the same execution. So on the surface, you can see they look pretty similar. But again, uh, these this variable might be named slightly differently. This variable may be named slightly differently. The way that you're getting the user may be slightly differently. Or if you're reusing this operation in more than two places, and in those two places, you want to check the permissions in two different ways. Guess what? Take this function and you don't put it in there because that's not actually reusable and that's not part of your business rule. So how you orchestrate these together is going to be largely dependent on your experience of being able to identify reusable parts of functions. And that is pretty much it. In the end, you go ahead, register your services. So user creates nested and transaction. And what was it in a batch services are registered. I've uh, previously shown on my channel how you can effectively write a little bit of reflection and uh, register these with the dependency injection container. You may need to, you know, public uh, class, um, write a little marker. This is going to be an attribute. So marker attribute, place this maybe somewhere over here remove the attribute and then you can say type of assembly load this in and automatically register it with your dependency injection container so if you feel like all right i want to write all this i'm going to have a millions of these you don't need to we write one one function that does the job of registering it at the beginning and uh, basically looking by this attribute and yeah that's going to be pretty much the end of it so you know how to make objects, you know how to make functions, you don't need to know anything else, just uh, don't be greedy with the code, you can write a lot of it, and you can very simply say, okay, this piece of logic is reusable, I want to go ahead and create uh, another object of it and reuse it in other places, if there is a very custom so let's say if uh, the logic over here can create something and can create a nested check. So these checks are currently sequential and it makes sense to reuse them because well, it's just sequential validation. Perhaps you want uh, your uh, fluent validation to handle it, but maybe what's actually going to happen is that this is going to be an asynchronous operation and actually a call to the database. And you're going to take a look at this man i'm going to be making like 10 calls to the database to validate this maybe i want to optimize this process 
So then you can effectively take this slab of code and instead of reusing it, just optimize it in place and not use it in other places. Hopefully you can get the idea of what I'm talking about in this example. Really what I'm trying to get at is not to think in terms of uh, rules established by principles like, or I don't know, principles, architectures, other, you know, buzzwords like CQRS, uh, clean architecture, anything else that says this has to be done this way, that has to be done that way. I'm telling you, look, you know objects, you know functions, uh, the, you use lambdas everywhere, you can use an object like a lambda, you don't need to go further than that. You just outline your little lambdas and you compose them together. And in the end, it yields very good compression of knowledge into that lambda, as long as you name it correctly. And they also tie up very nicely to your business jargon. So however people talk in the business, you're going to say a user is trying to upload a documents in a batch. Well, you already have an object or a lambda with a closure for that operation. You can literally press control shift 10 and find the object on it and start working on an issue that relates to that particular module. But this will be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. A big and special thank you goes out to all of my patron supporters. You help me make these videos. If you would like the source code for this video, as well as my other videos, please come support me on Patreon. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a good day.